My name is Stephen Rogers. First of all, let me welcome you to the Africa Faith and Justice Network, AFJN webinar series on issues impacting Africa and, and affecting Africa. This event is organized by AFJN and we've been here in Washington DC for almost 40 years next year. AFJN is a network made of 28 Catholic religious congregations of priests and nuns. AFGN is also a Pan-African faith-based organization. Actually, we are the only Pan-African faith-based Catholic organi advocacy organization based here in Washington, DC. We have worked on US-Africa relations for nearly 40 years next year, and um, we host timely events on issues pertinent to the continent. We do advocacy here in Washington, DC, as well as um, on, on the continent of Africa on various issues, governance, land grabbing, women's empowerment, environmental issues. If you want to know more about us, you can obviously, you can log into our website, it's afgn.org, and then you can see the work that we have been doing over the past 39 years, next um, 40 next year. This event is also co-sponsored by four of our many partners we have here in Washington, D.C., including the American Friends Service Committee, Marinal Office for Global Concerns, Samuel DeWitt's Proctor Conference, and Pax Christi USA, among others. Today's topic is going to be about reforming the UN Security Council, why it is it must be on the US African Leaders Summit. For the three panelists who are here and for our audience, there have been a very long call for more representatives to the United Nations Security Council. And there appears to be more some kind of agreement among the member states that reform would make um, the council much more effective and even if not effective, at least more representative in a manner that enhances its legitimacy. However, the path to that reform has been fraught with procedural and political challenges. Now, the reason for this particular webinar is twofold. First, on September 21, the US President Joe Biden actually told the UN General Assembly that the United, the United States backs an increase in the number of both permanent as well as non-permanent members of the Security Council. And to quote him exactly, he said, it become more inclusive so that it can better respond to the needs of today's world. He specified that this includes seats for nations the United States has long supported for countries in Africa, as well as for Latin, Afri Latin America and the Caribbean. He also committed the United States to not using the veto except rare extraordinary situations to ensure the council remains credible. Other global leaders have chimed in. This includes um, the French president, Emmanuel Macron, Naledi Pandor, the Minister of International Relations and Cooperation for South Africa. Nigeria's president, Muhammad Buhari, has also chimed in. And um, so we have seen a global consensus in terms of um, a conversation towards this. Now, the question actually remains, but how committed are these allies? What does reform actually even mean? What is an acceptable framework for all those involved? So therefore, what we are going to have today is our distinguished panelists who will unpack this. The second part of this conversation is really based on a shadow of the US-Africa summit, which will happen here in December, I think December 13 to December 16, where many of our global leaders will be here. Many of all of almost all of our African leaders will be here in Washington, DC to, um, to engage the US in a very organic way on issues um, um, impacting Africa. What the AFGN has been hoping to achieve from this is whether this conversation should be part of that broader conversation on how Africa um, can be engaged from the UN perspective and be on the table. Today, the three panelists will kind of unpack this Part of the reason why they were carefully selected is because they have been part of this conversation in their different forum. We are going to have Ambassador, Ambassador Ali Kaba from Sierra Leone, Dr. Richard Ponzio, as well as uh, Professor Martin S. Edwards. I will briefly, I will introduce them in much more detail and I would, they would come in and have this conversation in the order in which um, they have been called. Ambassador Ali, let me briefly give you his background, is from Sierra Leone. Sierra Leone has been one of the advocates for the global, um, for, uh, for a much more reformed UN Security Council. And Ambassador Ali was part of that conversation. Ambassador Ali has served as Sierra Leone's Minister of Foreign Affairs and International Cooperation 
and he is a permanent representative to and also a permanent representative to the United Nations here in, in New York. In both capacities, the ambassador was an unequivocal and he was very consistent in advocating for the common African position on reform of the United Nations Security Council as it was enshrined in the Ezulwini Consensus and the Satire Declaration in order to correct what he, what he calls the historical injustice done in Af to Africa. He is the recipient of several awards in recognition of his distinguished leadership roles in multiple civic arenas. His multidisciplinary background in history, he has a multidisciplinary background in history, in philosophy, in political science, and in public policy analysis, which have shaped his strategic thinking and direction throughout his career in public service. So we are going to be um, very, uh, we are very honored, Ambassador, to welcome you here. And um, I know I'm going to put you on the spot by asking you to be the first person to make a presentation here. You, um, all of you are going to have, I'm pretty sure has been communicated now, eight minutes to make your presentation. The idea is to have our audience to actually be able to participate and ask you questions that they came in here with. So um, with that, and hopefully with nothing much ado, I would pass on the mic to Ambassador Ali, whom I have a lot of respect for, to start this conversation, and then we can kick off from there. Ambassador, next to you. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for the uh, invitation. I want to, uh, at the outset, thank uh, the Africa Faith and Justice Network uh, for this invitation. It's always a pleasure to engage with uh, US-based Africa advocacy groups here and the are doing some good work in making sure that African priorities are on the agenda of the United States, uh, especially now as we speak. Let me also thank you for thinking about connecting the US-Africa Leaders Summit uh, with this particular topic, because it's important for us to understand why it has to be on this agenda. Uh, for Africa and all reform-minded member states, Security Council reform has uh, been a complicated and slow process, trapped in the interplay of divergent interests as demonstrated in the ongoing intergovernmental negotiations. In spite of over 25 years of constant reiteration of positions by UN member states, discussions on Security Council reform remain solidly frozen in the murky waters of endless repetitive annual debates, far from the shores of concrete progress or proposals. With that in mind, it is important to outline the common African position, which encapsulate Africa's legitimate demand as articulated in the Ezewini consensus with the following stand. One, Africa's goal is to be fully represented in all the decision-making organs of the UN, particularly in the Security Council, which is the principal decision-making organ of the UN in matters relating to international peace and security. Two, full representation of Africa in the Security Council means, A, not less than two permanent seats with all the prerogatives and privileges of permanent membership, including the right of veto and the five non-permanent seats. Three, in that regard, even though Africa is opposed in principle to the veto, it is of the view that so long as it exists and as a matter of common justice, it should be made available to all permanent members of the Security Council. Four, the African Union should be responsible for the selection of Africa's representatives in the Security Council. And five, the question of the criteria for the selection of African members of the Security Council should be a matter for the AU to determine, taking into consideration the representative nature and capacity of those chosen. To reiterate Africa's shared stand on the reform process, the African Union also established a committee of 10 heads of state and government, commonly referred to as C10, uh, to, uh, by the African Union with mandate to advocate and campaign for the common African position on the reform of the council. The main objective of this committee is to unanimously, I repeat unanimously and unequivocally call canvas for broad support for the common African position in the General Assembly and quote, build the momentum required for Africa to demand its rightful place on the global stage, end of quote. Members of the C10 for your information include the heads of state and government of Algeria, Congo, Equatorial Guinea, Kenya, Libya, Namibia, Sierra Leone, Senegal, Uganda, and Zambia. I'm very proud to note here that Sierra Leone has served consistently as coordinator of the CTEN. 
it's a huge national responsibility. I am confident that uh, my country, Sierra Leone, will carry this uh, mantle forward to its logical conclusion as soon as possible. Against this backdrop, it is logical to ask why should UN Security Council reform be on the agenda of the US Africa Leaders Summit? The obvious answer is simple because it matters to Africa and the US. It matters to Africa and the US. There are other shared priorities dealing with global health security, democracy, human rights, and the climate crisis, and so many others. But I believe that uh, Security Council reform matters to both Africa and the US. The summit, as the Biden administration contends, will demonstrate the United States enduring commitment to Africa and will underscore the importance of US-Africa relations and increased cooperation on shared global priorities. Perhaps more significantly, the Biden administration believes that Africa will shape the future, not just the future of the African people, but of the world. Africa will make the difference in tackling the most urgent challenges and seizing the opportunities we all face. I wholeheartedly agree with this view. Given the role of the UN Security Council in the maintenance of international peace and security, the question of African representation in the permanent category of the Council must be a priority for the US if it wants to stay true to its enduring commitment to Africa. Let me underscore that no meaningful United Nations Security Council reform will happen without the support of the US and other members of the P5, i.e. China, France, Russia, and the United Kingdom. We all agree that the world has changed a lot since 1945 when the UN was formed. At the time of its formation, the victorious allied forces shaped the architecture of the post-war international system. Africa was not at the table, nor in the room, just as it was the case during the 1884-1885 Berlin Conference when the continent was divided among European nations and without consultation with Africans, by the way. Our continent was firmly under the yoke of colonialism and foreign domination at the end of the Second World War. Hence, African states were not actors in the imagined international system born out of the ashes of a devastating world war in which African lives were lost in the trenches of battlefields far away from home in defense of European freedom. The victorious allies, the P5 granted themselves the veto power. It reminds us of the saying that all men are born equal, but some are more equal than others. Although it was initially seen as a promoter of international stability and check against military interventions, many now see the veto as undemocratic and anachronistic, unjust and counterproductive too. Various countries outside the permanent members have proposed limitations on the use of the veto, and reform of the veto power is often included in proposals for reform in the Security Council. Today, as complex global challenges and threats emerge in the face of near paralysis of the Council to act, US support for African representation in the permanent category of the United Nations Security Council should not be framed as merely a question of sentimental justice or lip service. The fact of the matter is that Africa plays an important role in the maintenance of international peace and security as seen in the continent's significant contribution to peacekeeping missions, which reflect greater coordination between the UN and the African Union. It should also be noted that uh, African issues are often on the agenda of the Security Council. I can even add that Africa is more on the Security Council than any region of the world. Therefore, African permanent representation on the Council will ensure that African interests and perspectives are crit are on critical continental and global issues are consistently discussed through an African lens. With 54 UN member states representing Africa and counting for 42% of the 129 votes required to pass a resolution enlarging the Security Council, it is obvious, as noted by many keen observers, that if the African group at the UN throws its weight behind a proposal, Africa will play the role of the key maker because of her numerical strength. Given the urgent need to address critical global pr priorities, 
It is time to move beyond the endless annual recycling of positions by various interest groups in the current intergovernmental negotiations or IGN that has gone on for far too long with no concrete proposal to move the process forward. President Biden's call for Security Council reform last September in the General Assembly may signal a rare opportunity to inject greater momentum in the reform process. The $1 trillion question is, will African leaders seize the opportunity to propose a draft document or text for real intergovernmental negotiations? No matter how long the reform process takes, it will end with a text. Better for Africa to be a strategic driver than a hesitant passenger on board the Security Council reform train. Thank you. Je vous remercie. I'm sorry, I had to unmute myself. Thank you so much, Ambassador. And um, I I thought you were going to just continue. I just kept listening to a real, you know, um, very well historic analysis, but as well as I'm um, really um, providing some broad perspective. And I'm happy that we started with that conversation, just giving us that historical perspective, as well as the really critical things that needs to be considered, as well as Africa's place in all of this conversation. So with that, um, what I'm going to do is we are going to have the speakers make their introductory all of them, and then before I go on to the Q&A. So I am not going to go, um, I would ask everybody to hold their questions for Ambassador Ali. I know there are quite a lot of questions. I'm going to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Richard Ponzio. And Dr. Ponzio is already here. It is my privilege and my honor to introduce to you Dr. Richard Ponzio, who is the Director of Global Governance, Justice and Security Program, and Senior Fellow at the Stimson Center where he's also, he also co-directs the Global Governance Innovation Network. And he serves on the coalition for the UN um, w, Women, I'm sure we need, and together first, steering committees and Climate Governance Commission. Widely, he is widely published. Dr. Ponzio has served in senior peace building roles with the United Nations, as well as the United States um, Department, in Afghan, Department in Afghanistan, um, Bosnia, Kosovo, New York, Pakistan, Sierra Leone, and the Solomon Islands. So basically, Dr. Ponzio is very well traveled. And I had the initial conversation himself and um, Ambassador Ali because he's actually been in Sierra Leone. So it is our honor and to introduce you and to welcome you, Dr. Ponzio, to make your opening speech here. And then we can move on in terms of QA. Welcome. Thank you, Dr. Rogers. It's truly an honor and a pleasure to be part of this important conversation on reforming the UN Security Council, why it must be on the US Africa Leaders Summit agenda in two weeks time here in Washington, DC, as noted by uh, our earlier panelists. Um, not only is this a timely topic because of the upcoming summit and, and because of uh, President Biden's remarks about Africa having a permanent seat on the Security Council at the UN General Assembly two months ago in New York, but it's a timely topic as uh, Ambassador Kaba rightly noted, because Africa is featured so prominently, the uh, largest number of peacekeeping uh, operations over the course of the UN's now 77 years. Uh, in 2018, over half of the UN Security Council meetings and 70% of the revolution, resolutions that in, involved chapter seven, the uh, use of force uh, uh, section of the UN charter, they all dealt with the continent of Africa. And, as uh, Ambassador Kaba and I were discussing prior to this program, uh, one of the largest uh, missions at, at, at its time in the early 2000s was in Sierra Leone, UNAMSL, and in 2006, uh, Sierra Leone and Burundi became member of uh, the first countries of another major organ of the UN that reports to the Security Council called the Peace Building Commission. So tons of peacekeeping, peace building, peacemaking experience across Africa. And it, it's with that expertise and knowledge that uh, Africa has so much to contribute over these next two critical years, not just because we're going to discuss today Ukraine and its implications, other ongoing crises in Africa and the Middle East, and why these are impetus for a Security Council change. But there is a intergovernmental reform process now underway called the Summit of the Future. It will take place in New York in September of 2024. There will be a, a ministerial touch base among uh, ministers, maybe even a few heads of state in a year's time in New York in September of 2023. Um, and at the same time, one of the tracks of work is a new agenda for peace. I hope many of you have seen the current uh, agenda for peace from 1992. 
and it touches upon all the major conflict management tools. My hope is that the new agenda for peace deals with changes in the uh, collective security architecture of the world, beginning with this important body, the Security Council. And we can use these next two years to not only focus political leaders, build political momentum and, and address the, the bottlenecks to these negotiations to expand the Security Council that's been going on since the very end of the Cold War in 1989, um, but, but providing a deadline for this decades old, uh, the uh, intergovernmental negotiations, the latest iteration has been underway since 2009 called the IGN. And uh, three topics that I'm gonna touch upon uh, today in connection with UN reform, besides expansion, modifying the use of the veto power of the Security Council should come up and engaging non-state actors, especially from civil society groups like those represented in the Africa Faith and Justice Network, religious organizations. Um, I've been asked also to say a few words in my opening uh, brief remarks about the Security Council's origins, whether this body is still relevant today, uh, the framework under which it operates, and allows for expansion and how uh, the continent of Africa, its 54 member states in the UN might benefit from expansion of the Security Council. In short, because there's a lot of history of why the Security Council was introduced in the 1945 UN Charter in San Francisco, but it has a lot to do with the failure of the League of Nations. And the League of Nations allowed, uh, encouraged decision-making by consensus. Sounds nice, we all wanna build consensus, but this in a sense, in de facto uh, sense, gave veto authority to all member states. And it's not the only, but it's a major contributing factor for why the League of Na Nations was succeeded by the UN, why it failed and, and, and precipitated the end, uh, the, the beginning of a yet another uh, war to end all war, the Second World War. Uh, from 1939 to 1945, and it was in meetings in uh, Washington that you know the, the Roosevelt administration and its State Department planning team played a big role in the authoring of the of the charter. But with f three other major powers at the time, Russia, China, and the United Kingdom, uh, they had a meeting in what is called Dumbarton Oaks, uh, a nice meeting place in Washington D.C. that came up with this idea of of a great power concert, you know, building on ideas that probably from the concert of Europe in the early uh, 19th century. But um, basically those four countries plus France was added not only to give permanent uh, seat and there were five other uh, elected uh, uh, non-permanent members of the original Security Council, but they were also given veto authority, these five permanent powers. And this was seen as a chief compromise, the big difference between the 1945 UN Charter and the League of Nations uh, combining elements of realism or what is often called real politic, uh, injecting this into what is otherwise quite an idealistic project, the United Nations Charter and, and the project of 1945. And this, of course, again, building on Woodrow Wilson's, uh, another U.S. president, failed uh, an initial attempt with, with the community of nations at the time, at the end of World War I, uh, to institutionalize global governance through the League of Nations. Now, Given that the UN today, given it, getting up to present day, it's heavily involved, engaged in at least monitoring, but also taking action in response, not just chapter seven, uh, peace enforcement, but chapter six, uh, peaceful settlement of disputes. Uh, chapter five uh, is the other key chapter on the UN Security Council, how it's set up. Um, I'll come to that in a second. But uh, yes, the UN Security Council has faced all kinds of challenges, and it's also sharing more and more of its uh, collective security role with regional organizations like the African Union, which has already come up in our conversation, sub-regional organizations, ECOWAS in West Africa. There's many sub-regional bodies, of course, across Africa that interface with the UN, especially on its conflict management roles. Um, but at the same time, yeah, I would say the Security Council is still highly, highly relevant. We wouldn't be having this conversation today, I think, if it wasn't. And, and, and as far as the rules of which the Security Council operates, I've already referred to them. It's really chapters five, six, and seven of this UN Charter. And I'm gonna to come to uh, one or two key elements as it relates to reform, because indeed, uh, even during the polarized environment of the Cold War, the Eastern Western blocs, the non-aligned movement, there was uh, expansion of the council from 11 to 15 members in 1965. Um, so that added uh, uh, six more non-permanent members today. This gave at the time uh, Africa, which uh, today is calculated as having 16% of global population, uh, the Africa group since 1965 having three non-permanent seats. So in um, 
the discussions that we're going to have today about the expansion. It has been done before. Uh, it can be done now, even in uh, an area of great power conflict and contestation. And the arguments in favor are, of course, uh, more representative uh, legitimacy, reflecting the political rea uh, realities of this current age. But as it relates to Africa, it should, having, uh, as Ambassador Kaba said, po potentially uh, not even one, but two more permanent seats, having more non-permanent seats could uh, lead to advancing interests and values within Africa. But I would argue that the biggest argument is better UN Security Council resolutions, better actions on the ground, given the focus has been so predominantly focused on the African continent over the years. And just take one statistic we've seen in the research uh, by the UN Security Council report, uh, quite often 80 to 90% of the resolutions in a given year are authored by two permanent members two famous former colonial powers from Africa and other regions, uh, France and the United Kingdom. It's so important that the pen, the authorship, uh, happen from countries within the region that are uh, affected and, and engaged. So in short, and for today's discussion, um, uh, taking advantage of this summit in September 2024 and the new agenda for peace that I refer to, it's so important that we have a Security Council that is reformed to reflect geopolitical realities and the multilateral principle of inclusive collective action. And in particular, I'll finish my remarks, my opening uh, statement by noting three types of reforms. The one that's gonna get most of the attention, the expansion uh, of the charter. And I'll be eager to hear what those in our audience have to say about uh, Ambassador Kaba's notion of uh, two more permanent seats for Africa. I think you said five more non-permanent. We've been writing in our work uh, through a commission with the great uh, African peacemaker and uh, former statesman of, uh, well, he's still in government, actually, chief of staff to President Buhari in, um, in Nigeria and was formerly a foreign minister, but he was a UN undersecretary general for three mm -hmm. secretary generals. That's Professor Ibrahim Gambari. And in a report with Madeleine Albright, a, a former uh, secretary of state, recently passed away uh, here in the United States in the last year. Uh, we advocated at least six uh, elected non-permanent seats be added to the Security Council. So go from 15 to 21. But here's how we get to the issue of a uh, uh, permanent membership. It is in, as I promised, I would read just one short statement from uh, Article 23. This is the chapter of, of, the, count of the Charter on the Security Council. And Article 23, Paragraph 2, concludes by saying, a retiring member shall not be eligible for immediate reelection. We recommend simply striking that. People always say, oh, you can't amend the charter. Surely we can agree on some language of getting rid of some language. This would allow larger countries in Africa. This would include, of course, Nigeria, South Africa, Ethiopia, Egypt, to have the potential to stay on and be reelected every two years. Some have also argued extend the period of time that countries are on the uh, on, on the council. That's another interesting related idea. Um, one of the most interesting that I hope we can discuss today, regional representation. You know, we, Dr. Ambassador Kaba mentioned consulting the AU. What about the AU being the representative uh, on the Security Council? It's not far-fetched when you consider that the G20 has uh, 19 major member states plus the EU, the European Union, on the G20. Uh, scholars such as Professor Jeffrey Sachs at uh, Columbia University has been advocating in recent years that the African Union uh, be added to the G20s. So in that same spirit, maybe adding a regional seat uh, for Africa. This is the best way to get compromise because I know there's a lot of differences of views among the Afri African states. Who would be a permanent representative? Would it be a rotational role? These are all things for discussion, and I'm, I'm most eager to hear from perspectives coming from the continent of Africa. Two final points, uh, curbing the misuse of veto. Many different proposals out there. It's so important that we address this fundamental issue that's led to paralysis. So much so, you know, we're seeing in the case of uh, the Ukraine crisis, of course, Russia is a belligerent and, 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 and of course, not allowing any serious discussion in the Security Council. Um, so, you know, for, for several years now, France and Mexico have had a proposal uh, and it passed a resolution with 120 plus countries saying no more use of the veto in cases of mass atrocities. You could add to that other humanitarian as well as natural disasters. In our own uh, 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 Gambari Albright Commission, we talked about having a no vote that does not account 
for uh, it's a dissenting opinion that does not equate as a veto, as a no vote in a formal sense. And we've had international law lawyers look at this and say, that's a brilliant idea because it allows differences of views to be voiced without sty stymieing progress of the, um, uh, the security council. But the last point, Licht Liechtenstein uh, responding to the first use of the Uniting for Peace resolution, that's when the General Assembly takes up issues when the Security Council fails to. That happened in the case of uh, Russia and the Ukraine uh, crisis earlier this year in March. And, and by April, Liechtenstein put forward a resolution that all vetoes of the Security Council should be examined and talked about. And then you know countries who that do vetoes should defend them publicly. And it's already happened now twice earlier this year in the case of North Korea, China, for the first time in 15 years, as well as Russia, vetoed a resolution in response to uh, missile strikes, or uh, not strikes, but uh, launch tests by North Korea. In connection with Syria, uh, Russia has lodged a veto over the summer and, and has had to been uh, forced to um, talk about it and defend it. It hasn't changed their position, but it puts a lot more pressure on uh, uh, these countries. And that's another argument for expansion, that more countries could lead to more pressure being put on those who use vetoes. I'll finish by saying that uh, the involvement of non-state actors is not a new topic. It's been around since at least 1992, when Ambassador Aria from Venezuela put forward the Aria formula to bring civil society and other non-state actors into discussions of the Security Council couldn't be more timely because besides the regular issues of country engagements on the Security Council's agenda have been thematic dialogues, HIV, AIDS, women, peace and security, uh, climate change, all those linkages to the Security Council's core focus on the maintenance of international peace and security. So much expertise comes from civil society and they need to be encouraged, but it should not be a informal ARIA uh, formula, but institutionalized and let's get beyond this, you know, don't call us, uh, we'll call you approach, but rather uh, a, a regular standing role for civil society actors, uh, mayors, uh, subnational actors to be involved in the work of the Security Council. This should become commonplace, just as it's done throughout uh, the other major organs and, of course, major fora of the UN, like the COPs that just occurred uh, in Sharm el Sheikh, uh, also in Africa. But to, to finish on that note, uh, civil society can be then a um, force for mobilizing the kinds of changes that we're going to talk about in today's discussion uh, with like-minded member states to expand and reform and improve the council and work towards the Secretary General's vision of more inclusive, uh, networked, and effective multilateralism. I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Posey. And that's, that's really quite refreshing, especially um, your expansion on how you think, I mean, your conversation about how you think other actors can come in beyond just state actors in terms of expanding the United Nations um, Security Council. Um, thank you so much. So I'm going to go to our next speaker. For our audience, I want to welcome you here. And um, this is the uh, webinar series for Africa Faith and Justice Network, organized by the Africa Faith and Justice Network. And we have our three speakers here. We have just listened to Dr. Richard Ponzio. Now, it is my privilege to introduce to you our next speaker. For our audience, if you have questions, please just send those questions to the chat room, and I will be delighted to, um, to direct those questions to our speakers so that they can more expand on what they have already said, or maybe clarify some of the things that you are concerned about. So keep sending those questions as you hear them, and I will be happy to do that. Now, I'm going to our last speaker for today, and then we go into the actual integrity of this conversation. This is going to be Professor Martin S. Edwards. Professor Edwards um, is, uh, is a professor, and he's also a chair at the School of Diplomacy and International Relations at Seton Hall University, I think, in New Jersey. He is a recipient of grants from the National Science Foundation, a former Fulbright visit Visiting Research Chair, and a previous winner of University Teacher of the Year. He currently serves as an Associate Editor for International Studies Quarterly. It is therefore my honor to introduce, um, to welcome Professor Mark Edwards, and um, the floor is yours. Welcome, and thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rogers, for that kind introduction. Um, <clears throat> Uh, I'm grateful. I'm grateful to the ambassador. I'm grateful for Dr. Ponzio for kind of laying the stage for everything. And what I'm going to do is kind of build on, on their, their excellent overview of everything that's at stake here. Um, I, uh, and perhaps I could be a little more pointed than the ambassador can. Um, I did to, you know, in a different line of work. Um, I think the idea of putting this on 
uh, the agenda for the uh, for the U.S. Africa Leader Summit is a wonderful idea, and I think that's true because, um, you know, President Biden says that he is committed to this, but of course, one of the challenges that folks that have been watching these debates that we've seen is that leaders can say that they are committed to Security Council reform rhetorically. Uh, they've been saying it for years, but a lot of that is cheap talk, right? And so we really need to move past this. We need to get in a world um, where we are actually bringing proposals for discussion. Um, so I think that, that in a sense, you know, taking the words of President Biden seriously and saying, okay, fine, you know, let's talk to the, about moving this conversation to the next level. I think that's fundamentally important. Um, so uh, one of the challenges that's kind of it is embedded in the charter, and this goes back to um, Professor Poncio's remarks, um, that, uh, the, that the idea was that members are elected based on two considerations, um, their, con their contribution to international peace and security and geographical equity. And there can certainly be a tension between those two, right? And so we're rightly putting the focus on equitable geography, okay? Fine. The challenge is, of course, that, you know, constitutions don't change all that often. The charter is the same thing. So it hasn't changed since the 60s. There's a reason for that. These things are sticky. Um, but also what it would require is a two-thirds vote in the General Assembly and ratification by two thirds of the member countries. All right, and so that would include all of the permanent members. So if we think about that in the US context, right, then that would mean a two thirds vote in the US Senate, which is of course a very polarized body. But that having been said, I think that, I think that this is, a, this is you know, we should recognize this as a challenge. We should run from it. Um, but I think it is important to note that there is a domestic barrier here as well as an international one. Um, but, the, you know, the question is, so it's like, okay, then if we put the onus on the president and say, put your money where your mouth is, then that means, you know, something that can be brought to a vote before the U.S. Senate. Um, so I think that... Uh, the notion of there being a window for reform, I think that's absolutely true. Um, I'm not sure how long the window is, though, um, because of course the window, the window for reform is in a sense that you can think about this as this two-year conversation about the summit for the future, but you can also think about it as purely being the length of the Biden presidency. Um, and so I think it's worth thinking about that. Because those time those those time constraints affect the nature of the negotiations that would go forward. Um, you know, if you think about it, this in the context of um, American presidents in year three, there's sort of wiggle room for movement, proposing new initiatives, and then in year four, everything gets preoccupied with the election. Um, so, if we think about it that way, that you know the that that we're on a shorter clock than two years, then I think then I think we have to think seriously about what is politically achievable. And um, and I think that this might this is where I'm going to get into trouble. <laughs> but I think that, that that's the question of we have to think about the nature of the ask and you have to think about is there a trade-off in all of the elements? Um, of the Ezzawini consensus. Obviously important that Africa have a united voice, undeniably. But there comes to a point where you need to think about, okay, are all of these elements equally important? Are there, is there something that we are willing to compromise with in the nature of the greater good, which is of course a greater African voice, which is obviously something that we'd all agree on. And so I think the question is, it, it, it is to me an open question of whether, whether we should let the perfect be the enemy of the good here. Um, given that there is always already so much work that's being done to delegitimize the use of the veto, right? The, um, the Liechtenstein initiative has already been discussed. Um, 
you know, it does to me make make uh, make make a bit of an open question is, is, you know, is this worth fighting for? Or might we be working across purposes and insisting expansion with a veto while at the same time trying to restrict its use of the veto? Those aren't necessarily in, in you know, opposition, but there is a bit of a tension there. And just again, if you think about this as a short time frame, this is something that, that you know, that we want to we want to be well aware of, uh, of working across purposes. Um, to me, I think, you know, these, this idea of getting back to dedicated regional seats makes every bit of sense. It's, it's in when we created the Human Rights Council. You know, we went back to this notion of, of, you know, seats that were allocated regionally, which makes, you know, which makes perfect sense. Um, and of course, what you, the, I, the objective in that should be to make this valuable. This is something that countries want to be on, you know, so that those, those elections are competitive. Um, and in that sense, you know, the, uh, uh, the idea of striking the um, no repeats portion of the charter makes perfect sense. It allows countries to develop expertise, um, you know, that allows the, these, these, these elections can be more competitive. So those things work well in tandem. Um, yeah, so going forward, I think the question for us to think about is, I, you know, I agree with everything the ambassador said, it's time for us to move from, from talk to words into an actual proposal. And I think it, to me, it's an open question about how much of that consensus um, is, something that is up for discussion going forward right? namely is this is this the take it or leave it is this a take it or leave it world that we're operating in and if so might we run out of time on the biden administration and thus closing our window so that's it look forward to um everyone else's observations and to an engaged discussion thank you so very much let me just Thank you so much, Professor Edwards. I'm sorry, I was muted. And that pretty much kind of really summarizes the overview of this conversation in a very broad way, but much more specific to how we can move on from here. And um, for my audience, and um, if you have questions, again, keep sending them, and I will be happy to share that with, the, with, the, with, the, with, with our speakers. And so what, I, what, I, what we seem to be getting here is really quite um, a, a very divergent view about the UN in terms of um, whether there is no reform, there's need for reform, and what that reform would look like if there is one. And so um, and each one of you seem to really kind of come around that in terms of the, that the UN itself, the way it was set up initially, has passed. I mean, it's, some of them may no longer be relevant because this was um, way back in 1945. And... I guess the broad question I'm going to ask, and I'm going to start with you, um, Professor Martin, just starting from the, um, um, Professor Edwards, sorry, just starting from where, because you asked the question, I'm pretty sure the other panelists are going to chime in on this. And you said that um, um, you, you believe there is, there is, there is room, there is, there is, there is an atmosphere for reform. In other words, um, there is an opportunity for this. And you said, and you said the window is there and what I wanted to know when you talked about the window, I think one of the things within the United States, you talked about the Congress itself, and um, some of these have to be rectified. Again, for someone who really doesn't know how this works, um, it's not very clear whether the, they don't even know whether these things have to go back to various Congresses and that you know has to be rect uh, within that before it ever gets in. Knowing how polarized the United States is, and having acknowledged all three of you that the US as well as the other permanent members are key to any reform we are going to have, um, what do you consider a, a window? Is it just the global atmosphere where we have US, France, you know, expressing this concern for their own obvious reasons, what is happening in Ukraine? Or do you feel that within the US itself, there is some level of um, uh, interest in this, or there could be outside the inertia? So I wanted to just tweet back on that because I don't see that happening now within the immediate effect. So what do you think would be a more proactive way of doing that within, I mean, from President Biden's perspective? I mean, when he said that, did he just say it or did he mean it? Back well, I, I, and again, I think it is an open question. There's been lots of country leaders that have said, yes, we want the Security Council to be more representative. 
And that's where this sentence stops because they haven't said the other thing, which is, okay, what are the details, right? Because that's the important thing. You know, um, if you never propose anything, then you just make these rhetorical statements every session and you seem like you're on the, on the side of reformers. In actuality, you're not because you're not proposing anything. You're not saying anything's good or bad. You're just sort of saying, yeah, it's a good idea. Um, so, I, you know, the window is the, the challenge is both the international level and the domestic level. So, so it would have to be ratified um, by the United States Senate and, you know, the, <laughs> the, where, where Democrats hold a thin majority. Uh, still pending the outcome of the of the Georgia of the Georgia Senate race, um, but it also requires a two thirds vote, and so this is where this again, um, unfortunately, um, makes threading the needle uh, difficult because a deal might be might get the support of many many heads of state, but might get might not make it through the U.S. Senate. So again, so that suggests using the summit to re <laughs> remind the president that this is an important issue. You know, it's like, if you genuinely believe Africa's the future, then it's go time, right? So, so for me, then that brings up all, all sorts of questions about, you know, is, is it the case that a smaller deal that basically, you know, gives Africa greater representation, but does not in require a veto. Um, is that something that one, is that something that could pass the Senate? Um, it's unfortunate that, you know, that the, the U.S. is in this moment um, where the level of, you know, we talked about the, the, the Cold War atmosphere of the 60s, the last time these reforms went through. But, and while obviously there's a whole lot of polarization internationally, it was never like, it was never this bad domestically as it is today. So that gives, you know, that, and so that might lead us, you know, to have this discussion to realize perhaps the Biden folks weren't terribly sincere because they knew that any deal that they would propose would never get ratified. That the, that senators would say, no, 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 we would get, we're we're watering down U.S. influence. Um, we're get, betraying the national interest. You know, so that is the challenge. That is a challenge. And um, when you said that, I was just thinking domestically how virtually almost very little thing gets done here when it comes to these broader international um, issues. It's always the right and the left way of looking at it. And I think, um, Dr. Ponzio, I wanted to just piggyback on um, some of the things I think you said. You said that the Security Council is highly relevant today. And one of the things that the criticism for the Security Council is that of course, because of his veto power, which um, Professor Martin kind of talked about, whether it's even important, because it has been de there has been a lot of effort to delegitimize the very veto power of the the Security Council. Why do we where, why do we probably need to talk a lot about reforming something that we have been delegitimizing? Now, when you say that the Security Council is highly relevant, and it sounds like the, the the idea here is to reform it as opposed to maybe just getting rid of it entirely. Now, one of the arguments is. The more you expand the Security Council, for whatever reason, whether we want to get it, you know, ge you know, geographically equitable, um, then it almost looks like General Assembly. For you know, well, then why do we want to do this where we can just get rid of it and have a general um, conversation about this? And I think there is a, there is some kind of um, um, there's some kind of um, substance to that based on what happened with the agreement on Ukraine, wherein um, there was very little agreement on that. And so my question would be. Um, if it's so relevant, and um, is it because of the veto power that it has and somehow that allows a quick decision, or do we think maybe the best way to um, kind of um, approach this is, I mean, I know the idea is to get it more equitable by having more, but why, I mean, how do you address that issue of the more you make it expand it, then it almost looks like the next level of the UN, UN body, then why would we want to have more people at the top when we can just all of us come together as a general assembly and agree on something? And I guess um, that's for uh, Dr. Ponzio. Um, 
Great. No, thank you, uh, Dr. Rogers. Um, yeah, I'll look at both the veto question and the related issues around the expansion and, and the ability, uh, we, it is possible to reform, as I showed during the uh, Cold War uh, battle between East and West. Um, on, on the veto's use, you know, one could argue going back into the history that this is, while uh, has led to paralysis and uh, difficulties of the Security Council saving lives and taking action, the cases just this year, Ukraine, uh, Syria and in uh, and, and, and response to North Korea's actions. Um, the reason we still have the Security Council and the UN more generally, Security Council, a very important body, the main organ that can enact binding enforceable law, uh, 77 years later compared to the only two decades long League of Nations is this uh, compromise, this pact that was made with great powers of the era now, the question is, haven't we moved on? Uh, geopolitical realities have changed. As Professor uh, Edwards has noted, it's not just geographical uh, representation that's important and embedded in the charter. It's also your contribution to international peace and security. That's why the case of having uh, several larger uh, countries, uh, India, I believe, has now surpassed China in the most populous country. Uh, Japan, Germany have been contributing to the UN's uh, budgets and uh, peace work. Uh, Brazil has come on strong in recent years, but it's very important in this context that we talk about Africa. And yes, leverage the crisis that is the one that is captivating most of these great powers at the moment. Ukraine, uh, President Zelensky has given several speeches in the Security Council this last year saying, hey, why don't you just close up the Security Council if you can't deal with this issue, even in connection with the energy, the attacks on civilian populations that are incessant and continue and are going to make for a ter terrible winter. Why not use that as a catalyst on top of so many other current and, and recent conflicts, especially in Africa and the Middle East, to get uh, uh, countries to realize this is the moment. The window is fast closing on expanding the UN, uh, the Security Council, and before the window closes, you know, maybe it is only these next two years and we're not going to see another opportunity for 10 or 20 years. Meanwhile, the world will move on. The Security Council could become more marginal at best. We've already seen attempts at coalitions of the willing or uh, major powers just focusing on their region and uh, setting up regional organizations that advance their own interests in a narrow sense. But don't forget, you know, countries like France have been for years advocating modifying the use of the veto in cases of mass atrocities. The U.S., I'd like to think it's genuine since the end of the Cold War, has been calling for an expansion. And in recent years, that has included uh, a seat in Africa and, and Latin America and the Caribbean. So it's, it's really important that we build on that momentum and uh, take these statements at face value and, and push leaders and hold them accountable for these statements. Even Russia, without being very clear, has always said, because it's good politics to say, hey, we're open to uh, permanent seats from these other regions. Uh, and so it's time that we hold their feet to the fire. China is going to be the most difficult because they uh, are in a constant uh, rivalry with their immediate neighbors, namely Japan and India. And uh, those are the two names that come up the most, actually, for a permanent seat on the Security Council. So we need to be aware of the, the political realities. But remember, multi di multilateral diplomacy, I'll finish on this point, is the art uh, and skill of yeah, what is possible. And so trade-offs, give and take on the wider agenda that will be discussed at the summit of the future, that could be part of a deal to allow for at least some change. It might not be ideal. It might need to be updated in 10, 15, 20 years at the 100th anniversary of the UN, 2045. But let's get some progress going on this debate that has been around in a serious fashion off and on since the end of the Cold War. I so agree. And I, I so agree with that we that we have to move on. And um and this debate has this is not new. Now, part of why we're having this conversation today is because the US is trying to engage Africa in a more organic way and on broader issues. And um here are civil society organization based in Washington, DC. And we also interface on the continent on these various issues. We know that the best way to engage those parts of the world is to get them on the table. And that's why this becomes really substantive beyond just the symbolic gesture. And that's why it brings me into the, to Ambassador, Ambassador Kaba, because you have, you you are an ambassador here and you, you've been on this table and, um, and absolutely you have also been really negotiating these issues. Somebody asked a question from the audience and I wanted to throw that to you. And if somebody else wants to chime in later on after your response, that would be great. And they said, look, nations seek power. 
and always never not to give up power. Um, I do, it is likely for those with power in security council to give it up for just empowering others. I think the question was, how likely is it for those who already have the power to give up that power uh, just by empowering others as opposed to you know um, not taking power from themselves? And just to add to that, that question is, you talked about um, Africans, uh, there's a need for an actual document, you know, that goes beyond this conversation when you're coming to this table. Now the Africans are coming here, the presidents are coming here. Is there something substantive they are coming with as a kind of proposal um, that um, how do we use that kind of modus, um, that kind of um, model to actually uh, bring reform in the UN. So this is really a broad question. So, but I, I'll hand that over to you, Ambassador Kaba, and then just you respond to that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, let me respond to that question and then a few other points here that have come up. It, talking about reform of the Security Council is really not about taking power from any of the P5s. Yeah, no one is saying that uh, we need a reform in which uh, the uh, P5 will no longer be P5 as we know them. Mm -hmm. And they'll still continue to play the role they've, they've been playing. And so that, to me, it's uh, one that's easy to respond to because it's not a question about taking anything away from those who are in. It's a matter of enhancing. You know, like uh, Professor Edward said, you know, this is really about uh, making sure that the Security Council is more inclusive, you know, that we work better and more effectively when the Security Council reflect the world as it is today. Yeah. And uh, the other point that I wanted to really highlight here is that, uh, again, coming back to Professor Edwards, you know, and I'm really glad that he's more candid on this issue. He noted that I was speaking as a diplomat, <laughs> but I think he's really helped. Uh, first, it is a fact that, as I noted, that uh, reform of the Security Council will not happen without the P5. Yeah, that's what I was driving at, that the United States has an important role to play. And I'm glad that uh, we have Africa-based advocacy groups now thinking about how to advocate for this. And I'll get into that later on. Uh, but uh, more importantly, you know, how to make sure that we take into consideration domestic political realities. Because it is not just about getting the uh, two thirds of the vote the 120 to 29 votes in the General Assembly. And as I said, 55, 54 votes for Africa already in the General Assembly is a good starting point, but it is not as simple as that. You know, the resolution can go through, but ratification is another issue. And that has to go to all the capitals of the P5. And so we already know the tension in Washington, DC uh, right now. Uh, we also know that uh, as, you know, Dr. Ponzi noted that, uh, for, for example, China will find it difficult to move this process forward for various reasons. I mean, the fact of the matter is that, as he pointed out, you have Japan and India uh, who are uh, likely, you know, candidates to be on the Security Council uh, just near them, and they have to think about their own national interest first. You know, that is just the nature of power, right? You have to think about your national interest until such a point that you can live with certain realities. But when change comes, certain things happen. You know, even the most reluctant will come around the table to see that it's in their best interest to accept this change. Talking about the domestic reality here in Washington, D.C., I agree really that uh, there's very little room right now in the Senate for moving this forward, especially when you start talking about two thirds majority, 60 voter plus to move this ahead. It's gonna to be tough. Uh, but I also know that uh, there are other important things, issues in the past that uh, went through uh, in spite of all those challenges. And one of the things is that uh, we need to make sure that the advocacy group start thinking about building a broad bipartisan support for reform. This is the task for those of you based in Washington, D.C., that you need to start to look at this now beyond just what's happening in New York to what needs to be done in Washington, D.C. It means engaging with uh, both progressives and conservatives. This is a bipartisan issue because you need all the support you can get, you know, to move this agenda forward to help President Biden, you know, keep his promise to do something about reform. So sometimes you have to make your allies do the work too, uh, by making sure that you help to make the work easier for them. 
And so I think that uh, for the Africa Faith Justice Network and others, you need to start thinking strategically about who are the allies, the potential allies to engage uh, in the Senate. You know, to start a conversation around it. And in terms of timeline, the window, I think that uh, we have to have much more long-term perspective. I'm not sure that uh, much can be done in a year or two. Uh, that's just the reality of how the game is played in the UI. And so it may not be subject to the uh, timetable in Washington, D.C. But I know also that uh, President Biden can lay the foundation moving this process forward in such a way that the process will be irreversible after him. I mean, think about the anti-apartheid movement, you know, and, you know, it took a while to get Washington DC to come in line with what the advocacy groups were demanding. And when you talk about sanctions against uh, the apartheid regime, it didn't happen overnight. It was hard work, you know, in the UK, it was the same thing. It was not easy to move Margaret Thatcher, just like it was not easy to move Reagan, all right? I remember that there was a time when the, uh, ANC and Mandela were all considered as terrorists. We've come a long way from that. So all I'm saying is that it's possible. It is hard, and I really appreciate that, you know, coming from uh, St. Edwards. It's a reality right now uh, that uh, much can't be done in Washington, D.C., especially when you're talking about issues like Security Council reform. But I also know that uh, if the U.S., especially the Biden administration, continues to focus on this issue, that alone can help. Because in intergovernmental negotiations, what is often lacking is clarity from the U.S. side and from the P5 generally. And, you know, they may come in with the nice rhetorical statements, uh, but the details are not there. For Africa, I have to also say that uh, I agree with uh, Professor Edwards when he said that we should be careful not to make the, the perfect be the enemy of the good. Mm. You know, the Izzouini consensus is great. Uh, I have to say that uh, it was hard work to get the continent to agree on a framework. And it has helped to build the, uh, the unity among the African group in advancing this important agenda. Well, like anything else, you know, I think that, uh, and I'm being a little bit more candid here, that uh, it is perhaps time to move on to uh, is a winning consensus 2.0. Mm. You know, the 2.0 that uh, will look at uh, the very, you know, framework of the consensus, agree with the spirit of it, but work on the letter. In other words, figure out what we can actually move you know, and perhaps think about a two-step approach. Mm -hmm. That will make it easier for African leaders to, to kind of move this forward because some are frozen too. African leaders are not necessarily all on the same page in terms of moving this agenda item for various reasons. And I call it the tension between bilateralism and continentalism. Uh, by that, I mean uh, your national interest, you need the roads and the bridges fixed uh, and the continental aspiration. And that sometimes can be a problem, you know? And so it's time to really look at, and this is a work for the African Union to see how we can look at uh, as the winning consensus 2.0 in the 21st century now, and what we need to do to make it work. Because listening here to Dr. Ponzio, it, it's clear to me that uh, if we are creative around this issue enough, uh, there could be a way to move this process forward. Uh, as opposed to repeating the same thing year in, year out. It just makes no more sense, you know, to keep this issue alive uh, when nothing is being done. As they say, insanity is when you keep on doing the same thing over and over, expecting different results. We need to start thinking outside the box. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Kava, and um, I appreciate that so much. And it sounds like there is some kind of consensus here, and the idea that somehow, you know, again, you know, there needs to be some kind of incremental process to this. Like we can't all have everything that we want, but there's the idea of getting to getting something done. Because let's don't forget the background of these conversations is that first of all, even though there is some kind of opportunity here from both the West to what Africa has already been asking for, um, the, the intentions might not necessarily be the same. And we all know that, I mean, for different reasons, but then that's an opportunity in itself. Um, how do we get something done, whatever the outcome that you want to achieve here? So I'm going to push back on that a little bit, but let me just throw in one question from the audience. And um, this question is coming from Nasimboa Hamida. 
And I'm, I'm just going to read it. I'm the convener of the Ugandan Women Collective Movement. I am a community organizer and human rights defender and activist from Uganda. I train social justice movements. It's surprising that the United Nations has a Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, who congratulated dictator Museveni immediately after he rigged elections in 2021. It is one of the most violent and de deadly elections in which 1 million youths were abducted, killed and buried in mass graves. This led to many of us activists to flee for our lives and are struggling in exile with our young children. Um, with our young children. The most unfortunate bit of it is how the UNHCR in Kenya is surrendering activists to the devil. A UNHCR that violates their mandate, making refugee camps a dumping site because they want to attract funding. UNHCR that helps. When does the UN Human Rights, let me just summarize, when does the UN, UN Human Rights Council help implement Joe Biden's manifesto on refugees, more so activists and HRDs? Now, I don't, uh, um, I don't think um, it's directly related to um, what we are, we have a conversation, but again, this speaks to the broader issues of what the UN deals with. I don't know if any one of you feel a little comfortable talking about this before I send another question or you want us to... Um, I don't know if any one of you would want to address that, but I think I guess the question is really about um, the United Nations just broadly, not necessarily in terms of um, what we are talking about, the Security Council. So if anybody wants to chime in, then I will. Otherwise, um, I would want to send another question. Which you know, I'll, I'll quickly jump in and, you know, we see parallels in Ukraine today, people thinking that the Secretary General should be doing more mediating and ending the conflict, but it does, the UN system, you brought up UNHCR. Uh, there's even often human rights monitors. They, there's a um, multiple roles that the UN has in, 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 in many countries in the world. And in the case of Uganda, you know, the argument could be that you don't want to uh, jeopardize the work of these humanitarian or even human rights actors on the ground uh, by making statements that will make the UN persona non grata. But with that said, you know, the Secretary General has a moral obligation, but equally so the Security Council, equally so, and I would say especially the Human Rights Council, it's in its mandate to promote and defend uh, human rights and, and governments. If governments aren't strong enough and powerful enough to collectively condemn uh, atrocities and actions that uh, where governments have failed in their responsibility to protect their own citizens, they have an obligation. This is a norm that's been around since at least the 2005 uh, World Summit, another period of reform when there were attempts at Security Council reform, at least it was tried, it didn't, did not succeed. Uh, but, you know, yeah, it gets to the heart of this debate that maybe it's not functioning the system and responding to cases of uh, egregious crimes because of the people who have seats at the table. And, and the, so the composition matters. It affects the types of resolutions that come out of bodies like the Security Council, let alone the Human Rights Council. But let's make sure we unpack the role of uh, the Secretary General versus member states, the, who I think have the chief responsibility for condemning uh, injustices in the world. Security uh, Secretary General represents thousands and thousands of international civil servants often operating in these countries. So they have to be delicate and they're quiet. If they're going to be effective, providing behind the scenes quiet diplomacy, good offices is a big part of uh, the Secretary General's mandate. It's all outlined in, in uh, Section 6 or Chapter 6 of the UN Charter. So let's keep that in mind uh, before we rush to judgment of why we're not seeing the Secretary General strong on being uh, vocally uh, sp outspoken on, on specific day-to-day uh, day -to -day issues, but I, you know, I sympathize with the views of the questioner. Thank you so much, Dr. Uh, Dr. Posey. And I am um, just, with, I don't know if anybody has wanted to respond to that before I go to the next question. Um, I have a few coming up. Um, so just, just to add to what you said, Dr. Ponzio, you, you know, I think basically what you're saying also is um, there's also need for communication in terms of what are the expectations of the United Nations in Santi areas. So sometimes citizens have a lot more different expectations from what the UN does. I come from Sierra Leone where I lived through the wars and I still remember when the UN was present in Sierra Leone and then you had the rebels take over the city and somehow they couldn't do anything because their job where I was very limited to just peacekeeping. And people were asking, why would you want to keep a peace when there is none? Why don't you, you know, save lives? So these things become a little complicated. And that's, I think that's one of the things that needs to be unpacked in addition to just unpacking 
in addition to unpacking the role of the Secretary General, what does the UN really does in those specific areas, at least for the people that it serves. Next question, and um, I'm pretty sure this is for all of you. Um, it says, would the future of Israel be in balance? Should there be this reform happen? This is related to Palestinians who still under Israel occupation and nations have always killed UN resolutions to recognize the rights of Palestinians. So this, um, I'm pretty sure this is very much specific to Israel and it's, and I mean, how it's, um, how it's gonna, you know, it's view it's in terms of whether there's an expansion. I don't know if anybody wants to chime in on that before I go to the next question. So um, I guess the, 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 the participant is just, is interested in what would be the role of Israel. Um, should there be a reform? Um, in the, the United Nations resolutions, which okay, one I one way to think about yeah. this. Go ahead, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, um, one way to think about this is this, is this does get to the broader issue about representation, yeah. right? And what priorities are we reflecting now? Um, I'm not really really big on prognosticating things. Uh, I certainly don't think the U.S. Israel partnership is going to change the function of whether you know how many seats there are in the Security Council. So I don't think that's going to change at all. But I do think that that, you know, getting at the heart of that question is is about who has a voice, who has representation. And again, that's what we're all you know in agreement that, you know, it's time for Africa to have a greater seat at the table. So the, the fact that, you know, questions are reflective of, you know, African priorities, I think, makes every bit of sense. Thank you. Absolutely. And, uh, I agree with that. You know, I know that uh, the. Uh, reform uh, proposals out there, you know, uh, ones that, uh, of course, you know, take into consideration the issues of fairness and inclusion and making sure that uh, their voices for Africa. Uh, substantively speaking, I would expect that, uh, you know, priorities for um, any P5 uh, will not change. Uh, relationships are there for various reasons, and those relationships are not going to change. And uh, member states have their positions on many of these issues, and uh, could be Israel, could be Palestinian issues, it could be specifically to Africa, and uh, other things such as, in fact, the climate crisis we face today. And so, I, I don't think that uh, that's any disruption of the balance, so to speak. It will really not affect that because there are other domestic considerations beyond what is happening at the UN for member states' position on certain issues and relationships they have. Thank you. I think that's that's a big, thank you so much, Dr. Kaba. Um, this question is actually, um, this was one of the major things we found, and this is going to be for all three of you. You can, you can speak to it now. Elliot Abrahams, who is a senior fellow for Middle East Studies um, at the Council on Foreign Relations, he argues that, quote unquote, he says Security Council reform is bad for the United States and unlikely to happen. Um, and I think one of, one of the things he says, I will have to hope that the current reform, and that is in court, efforts fail at all, uh, as all other past reforms have failed. Now, my question to you is, do you agree or with this, with his assessment of the current efforts that have been made. And I see Professor Edward Smiley. I don't know if you have a view on this and I'll share, this is for the team. So anyone can start. So he's very optimistic, he's very pessimistic that it, it will fail just like it has in the past. So this is really pretty much a talk shop. I'll pass that on to you. Who wants to go, Professor Edwards? Mm -hmm. oh. Sure, I mean, I, I, I think to me, to me, you know, this is why people are sometimes in that business to write provocative things. Um, but I, that having been said, um, you know, do I agree that this will, you know, harm the U.S.? Obviously not. I think it would have led with a very different <laughs> statement. You know, the premise of this whole thing is wrong. But thank you for the generous invitation. Um, so that obviously didn't happen. Um, I think, you know, I, 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 that, that this is kind of the challenge before us, right? I, I, I do think for purposes of lobbying, you know, by thinking about, okay, so we need to get to, you know, 67 votes on this. Yes. And that means we're going to have to talk to Democrats or Republicans. I think that position is well worth keeping in mind. Um, that, you know, the idea that, so, and so that would mean 
you know, egg grassroots groups in talking with their, you know, senators are going to have to say, here is why this will not harm U.S. interests. So the first part of his statement there, right, taking issue with that. Um, and I'm reminded, uh, the Ambassador Kabah mentioned um, apartheid, right? And, you know, the, the grassroots work on apartheid was rooted in justice, but people also had to make sort of hard arguments about national interests here as well. And one could do this exact same thing with Africa because, you know, for sometimes for some, some observers, you know, that, that their interest in the U S interest in Africa should grow, not out of a, um, sort of a recognition of responsibility, but out of a purely strategic calculation mm -hmm. about enhancing U.S. influence to combat that of China. So as we think about how to play this game and address those arguments, those sorts of, those sorts of things are going are gonna to need to come back into fashion really fast in order to figure out how do I persuade these folks that this is really not the case. I mean, quite obviously, you know, if that were true, then the move, you know, then the move in the 60s from you know, uh, from, you know, um, and adding the non-permanent members should have somehow reduced U.S. influence in the council, which quite obviously didn't happen. So, you know, it's, it's, not, rem it's not remotely true, but it's a nice, you know, provocative thing for people to get us to talk about. <laughs> and I'll, I'll jump in and build on uh, Professor Edwards' uh, response. You know, the least compelling uh, argument in this town would be we're going to have higher quality UN Security Council resolutions, uh, more countries from Africa represented on the council, permanent seat even, um, could translate into uh, more effective uh, peace operations mandates and, and, and other types of uh, actions, hopefully short of the use of force, chapter six, uh, use of uh, mediation, good offices, conflict prevention, a very important priority of the current secretary general. Uh, and this saves money, by the way, of the major donors who pay for uh, peace operations and, and other kinds of, you know, reconstruction, recovery from um, uh, deadly and, 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 and uh, major material loss uh, types of conflict. Now, but the, the argument really should be building on Professor Edwards' point, the competition with these great powers and knowing that they can go elsewhere if the UN is not made more effective. And, and I think the U.S. supports the language of more uh, inclusive representative legitimacy. This is language that President Biden used in his statement and, and various US presidents and leaders have used in, in the last few decades. And, and that is you know, the reality just in China alone, its ability through its Belt and Road Initiative, support for an Asia infrastructure investment bank, but working in, in, in across Africa can have tremendous uh, influence, is having tremendous influence outside of the multilateral system. And we need, uh, you know, there's always gonna be competition among these great powers, but doing so peacefully within the multilateral framework and, and making them uh, adopt best practices when it comes to aid effectiveness, uh, when it comes to helping on conflict mediation and very sensitive issues dealing with a country's national sovereignty, wouldn't you, the country receiving or the continent of Africa prefer that things are under a microscope and, and, and a lot of transparency in multilateral bodies rather than uh, dominant actions of one country. I know that's the critique of the United States when it's involved in actions in parts of the world, maybe building coalitions of the willing to support its actions, but there's a lot of criticism, especially if it bypasses the uh, Security Council, which has happened once or twice in recent memory, as we all know. Um, but, but, but final point, the BRICS includes several democratic countries, including front, so that's the uh, South Africa, uh, an African country, Brazil, India, these are democratic countries, and they're banding together with Russia and China on a BRICS development bank and potentially could set up other act activities that parallel that, that run in competition to uh, the 1945 multilateral system. So there is a lot at stake here if we don't reform, upgrade, and make sure all countries, rising powers, including in Africa, feel they have a seat at the table and, and that are, they're not just rule uh, takers, but they're contributing to rule making. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah. Mr. Kabad, did you want to add that something to yes. that? Or yeah, if I may just add, please. The fact that uh, today we are talking about a US uh, Africa Leaders Summit in Washington, this is speaks to the fact that uh, 
you know, the uh, vital interest of the United States of America is reflected in how the administration is engaging with the continent. It is not simply a case of you know, humanitarian or charitable act. This is one in which when you look at the world as it is today, and if you count votes in the UN General Assembly, then you'll know that uh, 54 votes from Africa should mean something to anyone who knows how to add numbers. And also the fact of the matter is that uh, those who are opposed to Security Council reform do not really understand that uh, in the 21st century, with this kind of multipolar world we are in now, of course, with US as dominant power, nobody doubts that. It is always good to be seen on the side of those who will stand with you when the hour comes. Mm -hmm. huh? And when you look today, I don't see how one can be opposed in the Washington, I mean, can be opposed to, I say, India or Brazil or Japan or Germany for that matter, you know, to be honest. Germany and Japan contribute immensely, actually, to the UN of, uh, um, of system as a whole, you know, and uh, for, say, countries like Sierra Leone or the Congo, Democratic Republic of Congo, Somalia, others, uh, in need of uh, in Sierra Leone in those days, but now those other countries in need of uh, uh, peacekeeping support. Uh, you'll understand that uh, it, the, the, the U.S. has an important role uh, to play, and I really hope that uh, we can uh, help, especially you, the advocacy groups, help to define by uh, reform issue as one that is in the vital strategic interest of the United States of America. I agree with uh, Professor Edwards on that, you know, because it has to be, you know, otherwise it's not going to happen. And I know that the bipartisan strategy that you need to develop to bring others on board will work if it is framed that way, you know. And finally, uh, quickly on this one, UN Security Council reform is really one that speaks to the UN that we want in the world we live in today. Seven, seven years since the UN was established, if we continue the same formula and we know new challenges have emerged, it's going to be almost impossible for the UN itself to be relevant. And major powers will find it relatively easy to jump out, you know, and work on other arrangements. Do we want that? No. I think having a UN that works is good for everybody. And that is why I hope that uh, we can continue to uh, convince those on the margins who think that reform efforts should fail to come on board and uh, to understand that United States leadership on this issue is critical. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Kaba. And I see, um, I know we are running out of time. We have seven minutes and there's, I can see a lot of questions here. And I see Dr. Pauline Muchina from Adna. I see your hands are up. So we are going to just to use an effective use of this time. And I, the panelists have been so awesome, especially with a lot of a lot of points here that I have my sticky, sticky notes all around here for advocacy. My last question is gonna be on that. So I will, I will give each of you maybe a, maybe a, a minute or two um, to kind of you know, the way forward for us here as Advocacy Network, because we're gonna be a part of the US Africa Summit, but also in terms of reframing this, because what I seem to be getting from all three of you, especially Prof Edwards, and I think I'm, um, Professor Kaba as well, Dr. Kaba, you also said, you know, all politics is local. The idea is to how do we reframe it and people and that, you know, the local, um, the local populations that actually impact the politics in this greater nation see this uh, as in their interest, as opposed to, um, you know, making UN more effective. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask Dr. Pauline, um, I know you are, you are, if you can just briefly, you got 30 seconds to just um, maybe send your question. I'm going to allow you to say it and then um, I'll ask my final question to our panelists. Go ahead, um, Pauline. Well, thank you so much. Uh, the issue is democracy. If you cannot have democracy at the heart of United Nation, how do you expect to be a credible institution? That is what the UN is. The leadership of the UN, especially at the UN Security Council, it needs to be expanded because if it doesn't expand, 
then it will remain a neo-colonial institution and racism is playing a part in this context. I know that uh, Dr. I mean, uh, Sir Martin Edwards was saying that, you know, we have to identify priorities. This is a priority for African countries. We do not want other people to be making decisions for us at the UN. We need to be at the decision making table and that is UN Security Council. So we cannot delay the conversation on behalf of priorities. And we know that uh, the heart of all of this, when this was created, African countries were seen as irrelevant in terms of making decisions. Now we need to be there because we are making our own decisions. We are not only asking for help, we are asking to make decisions that will determine our future. Thank you. Thank you so much, Pauline. And I'm glad to hear your voice after a while, Pauline. Welcome back. Um, Thank so I you. Guess, I guess her question is very clear. And um, I don't know if Prof. Edwards wants to take that or anybody else on the panel. Go ahead. Um, I definitely don't dispute the premise in any way, shape, or form. Uh, I think the question, the question for us is, is um, Africa's, you know, I, and I, I really, I really like the way that um, the, the sentiment was sort of wrapped up at the end is that, you know, is that Africa needs a stake in the destiny of the organization, which is absolutely true. And I think the challenge for us is to figure out, okay, how is that best done? Right. And not, not in a, and not in a way designed to limit or truncate voice, but rather in a way that sort of recognizes the political barriers that have present, prevented reform for many, many years now. Okay. And I'll Thank just you. jump in. And I know, uh, Dr. Rogers, you wanted us to sum up within a minute uh, as we're closing up. Oh, the discussion. Can, no, but, but just to say that, uh, which speaks to the excellent question by the last panel, which I think all panelists concur, the sentiments of that question and, and the need for uh, representative legitimacy translating into more effective and, and certainly more inclusive uh, Security Council, better functioning Security Council that can deal with uh, conflicts not only in Africa, but uh, around the world, including what uh, many great powers are consumed with currently putting a lot of time, political attention, and of course, financial resources, military support uh, to the Ukrainian people and government. Um, but but you, uh, Dr. Rogers asked how could a network like Africa Faith and Justice, I really do hope this discussion has spurred a desire, not just these next two weeks and what's on the agenda of the US Africa Summit uh, here in Washington, but these next two years, the summit of the future, uh, there is uh, a global civil society umbrella coalition that was mentioned in my own introduction. I'm active in the coalition for the UN we need. There will be a meeting at UN, at possibly UN headquarters, but definitely in New York on the 20th and 21st of March. So that's coming up fast because it's not just the summit all the way into 2024, but there will be a ministerial level meeting uh, and, and probably half or more of the agenda will already be developed by uh, September of next year. So it's very important that uh, networks and uh, faith-based uh, groups such as the Africa Faith and Justice Network contribute your ideas on the issues we discussed in today's program, but many related, the whole 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, how we improve the agencies, programs, funds to help countries deliver on this most important set of issues, which of course includes climate action, as we've seen the last two weeks in uh, Shamar Sheikh in, uh, in Egypt. Uh, so uh, I will be sure to share with the organizers, with Bharati, Bahati and uh, Dr. Rogers, details on how your community can get involved in this one element of civil society organizing around these issues and hoping to make a difference. Please do. Thank you so much. And um, please do share that. Part of what this, um, this series are about is also to, um, when, we, when we invite our very distinguished um, guests to come here and share their perspective, it's also engage with them beyond just these conversations in terms of how we can be more effective here on, in trying to um, you know, raise the voice for Africa and also um, be able to be more impactful beyond just the, the sound bites or beyond just these broader meetings that happen. Um, so thank you for that, Dr. Ponzio. And um, I don't know if anybody wants to respond to, to, to Pauline or there are a couple of questions here, but I don't know since we are running out of time and I want to be very respectful of your time, except if you have time. But if you don't, then I will be respectful and just 
move on to the final summary, summary, maybe three, four minutes, and then we can move on from there. Did uh, Dr. Kabat, did you want to say something on police? Or? Yes. Okay. I just want to say that I agree with her, her perspective on the issue, what she raised. Uh, the fact of the matter is that it's one of the key uh, arguments, you know, for reforming the Security Council uh, to ensure that there is African permanent representation. And now that's called permanent because there are some proposals that simply want to give Africa a few more non-permanent seats. Uh, but I believe that uh, having permanent seat will ensure that uh, many of the issues affecting Africa will be uh, discussed, you know, having the uh, authentic African lens in the room, so to speak. And it is in the interest of the Security Council to make sure that uh, the frustrations on the continent, you know, regarding how the UN Security Council operates, the decisions vis-a-vis -vis African countries, you know, it's one that uh, should factor into our thinking as we uh, move forward uh, with the reform process. And finally, just speaking to that too, there are definitely uh, issues around uh, how, in fact, uh, Africa uh, is constantly on the agenda of this UN Security Council, yeah, unlike other regions of the world. Yes. And do we want to continue to present Africa as um, victims, as a continent of uh, quote-unquote crisis, instead of a continent uh, that is really playing its own role in the maintenance of international peace and security? Uh, we do have uh, a sense of responsibility on the continent today uh, that has really helped the African Union shape our priorities in terms of the building the architecture of peace and security on the continent. The African Union is leading efforts to resolve the crisis in Ethiopia, uh, working on issues in Somalia, as we speak, the Sierra Union peacekeepers in Somalia, you know, and so Africans are becoming increasingly responsible for the destiny of the continent, and therefore the Security Council should reflect uh, the values of uh, democratic uh, you know, norms uh, in terms of making sure that uh, when decisions are taken, that uh, those who are affected by those decisions are also represented. As you say in the U.S. in those days during the fight for uh, American independence, no uh, taxation without representation. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. That's a very great way to summarize it. And you're right, you know, Africa has to be presented for who we actually are. We are not asking for charity. And that's always our position. We are a major stakeholders. And if you, for some reason, you ignore us, you do it at your own peril, because absolutely we have something to bring to the table. And as Dr. Ponzi rightly said, he mentioned BRICS, which is um, an alternative, Brazil, Russia, India, China, these other organizations as an alternative to the so-called Bretton Woods institutions, the IMF, the World Bank, which we are not serving the interests of the bottom billion, the five billion plus people who really don't fit into this bigger global um, agenda. So let me just, as a way of, um, I would ask you guys as, you know, just a summary of, you know, your final statements. I would take one question from the audience, which they wrote, and you can use that, either you respond to that, or you can just provide your final statement on this. Um, somebody said, as we talk about UN reforms, the expanding representation to include Africa, it is important to ask whether African countries are wholly committed to this. I get the sense that while some African countries may want reforms, others are consumed with domestic and regional interests and are quite comfortable with how things are. The African Union, which should also be championing this cause, isn't as loud as it should be. If as Africans, we are not united, how do we expect to score on this point? What will it take to get the continent on board? Has enough been done to sensitize African governments? As much as the P5 are talking about wanting reforms, we all know it's not the most important thing for them. So this is um, a question from the, from the audience. So I think, oh, it's a question to all with reference to unhealthy geopolitical, economic and competition among members of the great powers, especially in the continent of Africa from colonial days to present, how can we reconcile that with their compromise with granting African membership to the Security Council? So these are like two broad questions. So what I'm gonna do is as a way of um, summarizing your points, I will give each one of you a minute and a half or two to either respond to these questions or summarize your brother um, takeaway from this conversation and how we can move forward. Anyone can start. Sure, I'll, I'll be uh, very brief because I thought the words Ambassador Kaba finished on um, 
that Africa has so much to offer. Don't don't see it as a, a country in crisis. Of course, it's been big focus and and, and on at the heart of the agenda of the Security Council. But it's the success stories like Ambassador Cabo's own uh, Sierra Leone coming out of a, a peacekeeping environment, being among the first on a, a peace building commission, uh, a country, and 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 graduating from the peace building. Uh, agenda after you know multiple elections that were successful changes of power and and really uh, sowing the, so, the seeds of long term sustainable and and you could argue just uh, peace uh, and and so it's learning those lessons and insights from countries like Africa uh, Sierra Leone and across Africa that make it invaluable for other regions of the world and it's yet one more powerful argument for increasing African representation uh, on on the council. Um, but but to, the, to respond to that first uh, really provocative yet important question, you know, maybe because only six, half a dozen or so countries are really talked about for mm-hmm. permanent seat, uh, just to provoke everybody, maybe you'll get all 54 member states of African group to be interested in this subject if they saw their own representation being there. And that would come through a, a very real discussion about regional representation through the African Union, which I, I made that point once or twice, so I'll just leave it there. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Pozio. Uh, Prof. Edwards? Um, yeah, I think that, I, you know, I think we, we came, the, the premise of the question, right, the need for reform, I think that that's our, always been, already been established, right, and we're all in agreement on it. I think the question, the question for us to think about, this is always the case with anything is the details, right? And that's where it gets tricky. Um, and so this conversation is obviously an important, is obviously an important one, but, you know, I, I was sort of struck with the first question, you know, is basically about attention. Leaders have their own issues to think about, but of course that's said, that's said in every country, You know, the nature of the challenges that we face, we just came out of a global pandemic. You know, it's like we're facing, we're facing climate change. It's, it's incredibly real. It's incredibly serious. You know, it's like that necessitates international cooperation. So that, uh, to me, that should give an added impetus to these discussions um, and not necessarily detract from. Hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you again for the kind invitation. Thank you, Prof. Edwards. Um, Ambassador Ali, come out. Yes. Yeah, thank you. Uh, let me say that uh, the uh, comment, you know, speaks to a very important uh, issue, which is uh, the uh, readiness of African leaders, you know, to move this uh, agenda forward. And of course, the role of the African Union in that, you know, uh, yes, there are many challenges in, in uh, several African countries, perhaps all today. Uh, but the fact of the matter is that uh, there was uh, a time when African leaders recognized that uh, having African permanent representation in the UN Security Council was essential in promoting international peace and security. And of course, you know, continental peace and security too, and other priorities of the continent. I know that uh, there's always the tension, as I said earlier on, between what I call the imperative bilateral interest and continental aspiration. But this is one that I think there is uh, unanimity on the content. You know, the fact that we have this winning consensus, uh, which outlines broadly what Africa sees as a, a reform UN Security Council in terms of African representation is a good starting point. And then we have to get into the real negotiation. And this is the point that I raised in my introduction that we have to move now from this uh, intergovernmental negotiations that have been going on for so long with nothing to show for it right now to real negotiations, which means that we already know uh, the position of the various interest groups. You know, it's repeated year in, year out. You know, what we need one is to make sure that the United States of America comes to the table now with more and more clarity in terms of what you would like to see. That's very important to signal to the General Assembly, to member state, that the US can live with this particular proposal. Uh, France has been uh, more candid on this issue 
and uh, United Kingdom too, I must say, I uh, want to see that the P5 as a whole, Russia too, you know, as uh, Professor Edward said, you know, it's good politics, as I want to say it. But we need to have seriousness in the process. That is what has been missing. And if we can have a level of seriousness and commitment to make sure that, uh, you know, there is a consensus, consensus in terms of what do we see as the final kind of text in this discussion. You know, what do we want to come up with? A draft. Nothing happens in the UNCC or some state, uh, but it's only in the IGN that nobody wants to come with a text. Everybody just wants to talk, give a nice statement and go home and come back the following year. Uh, so Africa needs to be taken seriously on this issue. And Africans, African leaders in particular, have to also take themselves more seriously on this issue because continental aspiration is a reflection of our quest for dignity in the international system. And if we cannot do that, then uh, there's no need to waste the time of the P5 or all others on this issue of reform. Thank you so much for the opportunity to be here. And I look forward to working with the advocacy groups in the future, uh, see how we can do to move this uh, process forward here by building a domestic constituency for Africa and the Ezewini consensus in particular. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Ambassador Kaba. And um, you you close where you started. And um, you speak like a true diplomat. You talk about diplomats talk a lot. We need to move beyond that. And that sounds like that's what all three of you seem to be saying. There is a lot of optimism here, in spite of the acknowledgement that there are difficulties with this. I want to thank you for you know going beyond the 12, 12 midday. It's now 12.11. And thank you for the extra 11 minutes that you added to your generosity that you gave us. That's in-kind service to AFJN. Um, the Africa Faith and Justice Network, as you all know, we are here, we're based in Washington, D.C., and we, we, our goal is to highlight these issues, but just to move beyond these issues also to actually engage our lawmakers here in D.C. and also on the African continent so that together we can seriously move these discussions to the actual um, policies that actually impact our people. So I want to thank you. And for those who joined late, we have recorded this and it will also be on Facebook Live and to our, some of our websites. We want to thank our three very distinguished um, speakers. And we are going to uh, keep engaging you on various other issues that are very close to your heart, but also very important to our mission. So on behalf of the African Faith and Justice Network, on behalf of my staff and on behalf of our board, thank you so much for this conversation. And we are hoping that this will lead to something more substantive here in DC. Thank you and you have a very wonderful day. Bye-bye, thanks.